Hello everybody and welcome back to Vehicles of War Thunder. So in this episode we will be touching our first British aircraft. So, as will often be the norm, we are going to be starting with the reserve vehicles. So, let's go ahead and take a look at the Hawker Fury. There are two versions of the Fury available in game. You have the Fury Mark 1 and the Fury Mark 2. These two vehicles make up two of the three reserve aircraft that the British have access to in their air tech tree. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and hop into the design and operational history of this aircraft. During the defense air exercises of 1930, the Royal Air Force found out that their recently adopted Bristol Bulldog was some 10 miles per hour slower than the Hawker Hart bomber that had also recently joined the ranks. During these exercises, the Hearts were able to go through their assigned tasks without any disturbance from defending fighters, a role played by the Bulldog. The obvious answer to the RAF was to make a fighter variant of the Heart. That Heart was born in 1927, around the use of the Rolls-Royce FXI, might be 11, I don't know for certain, uh, inline engine with a light fighter variant being developed in parallel. The prototype of the fighter variant would be known as the Hawker Hornet and make its first flight at Brooklyn's Surrey in March 1929. This model would be powered by a 420 horsepower Rolls-Royce F-11A engine, enclosed in a smooth streamlined cowling, but the engine would be later replaced by a 480 horsepower F-11S, also known as the Kestrel IS. This prototype would be evaluated against the similarly powered Fairy Firefly 2 and would win out over the Firefly due to its better handling and all metal structure compared to the mainly wooden construction of the Firefly. When the aircraft was accepted by the Air Ministry, a small initial production order of 21 aircraft was placed in 1930. These aircraft were designated as the Hawker Fury because the Air Ministry wanted fighter names that reflected ferocity. The Fury was the first operational RAF fighter to be able to exceed 200 miles per hour in level flight and had an excellent climb rate of around 12.1 meters per second that allowed it to quickly intercept bombers. As will be noted later on, the game actually has a higher climb rate, but it's also possible different metrics are being used for this. This was all possible thanks to the 525 horsepower Rolls-Royce Kestrel 2, or Kestrel 2S? IIS? I'm assuming 2S. Engine. An experimental prototype called the High Speed Fury was built by Hawker to test design features for Hawker's planned competitor for the F730 fighter competition. The Hawker PV3 was the name of that competitor. This planned competitor would not work out, however, in the end, largely due to its unreliable, evaporating, evaporatively cooled Rolls Royce Goshawk engine. Some of the improvements, however, for this prototype would make their way into the Fury 2, including a cleaned up airframe to reduce drag and a new engine in the form of the 640 horsepower Rolls-Royce Kestrel 6 pistol, piston engine. All Furies, with the exception of some Spanish ones that I will mention why later on, were equipped with two 7.7mm Vickr machine guns with 600 rounds per gun. Now for the operational history. The Fury 1 would enter squadron service with the RAF in May 1931, re-equipping number 43 squadron. However, due to financial cuts because of the Great Depression, only a small number of Fury 1s were ordered, also equipping number 1 and number 25 squadrons. At the time, the slower Bristol Bulldog equipped 10 different fighter squadrons. The Fury 2 would enter service in 1936 to 1937, increasing the total number of squadrons equipped with a Fury to 6. The Fury would remain in service with RAF Fighter Command until January 1939, after which it would be largely replaced by the Gloucester Gladiator and other aircraft such as the Hawker Hurricane. Even after being pulled from frontline service, however, the RAF did continue to use the Fury as a training aircraft. The Fury was also exported to several customers, including Spain, Yugoslavia, Persia, Norway, and Portugal. These export models would have some differences. For example, three Furies were ordered by Spain in 1935 with the intention to produce another 50 under license. The Spanish variant had a cantilever undercarriage with doughty internally sprung wheels, similar to those used on the Gladiator. 
and were powered by a 612 horsepower Hispano Suiza 12 XBR engine with a speed of 234 miles per hour. The three Furies that were delivered arrived on July 11th, 1936 without armament. They would enter service with the Spanish Republican Air Force and be equipped with machine guns salvaged from crashed aircraft. The Nationalists would manage to get their hands on a Fury after it was forced to land behind their lines after running out of fuel. The Nationalists would repair it, but they would not use it operationally. Even after being removed from service with RAF squadrons, the Fury would continue to see service with foreign air forces include throughout the 40s. An example of this occurred with those used by Yugoslavia during the German invasion. On April 6, 1941, a squadron of Furies took off against invading German BF-109s and BF-110s. During the resulting battle, 10 Furies were destroyed. This was most of the squadron that took off. During this time, the commanding officer of the squadron, Major Franjo Dizal, definitely mispronounced that, watched from the ground as his men were shot down in their obsolete biplanes. Of the attacking Germans, five BF-109s and two BF-110s failed to return. Most were deemed non-combat losses, but at least one was lost after being rammed by a Fury. Other Fury squadrons during the invasion would focus on strafing enemy tanks and other ground forces, with some being lost to ground fire and one being destroyed in a dogfight with a Fiat CR-42. Some ex-RAF Furies would also be used by the South African Air Force against Italian forces in Africa in 1941. Despite their obsolescence, they managed to destroy two Caproni bombers. Let's talk about how the vehicle actually handles in-game now, though. The biggest issue I have with the Fury and War Thunder is that the 7.7mm machine guns that are pretty common amongst British vehicles, whether they be Vickers or Browning, is completely irrelevant in my experience. Just aren't that good. You, you often need to dump stupid amounts of ammo into your enemy compared to what basically anything else you're going to go up against would have to do. And I attribute this largely to the fact that you don't have any particularly good incendiary rounds, for one. Um, so that you're not likely to set enemies on fire for the most part. The Vickers that is used here in the Furies does have an IAI, which is what intermediate action incendiary or something like that, if I recall correctly. So technically you do have an incendiary. It's, it's just not that good is really the best way to describe it. Um, there's just... Yeah, God, it's terrible. It really is. And you compare this to what many of the other um, countries that you're going to be going up against, and their guns are just so much better in many ways. I mean, sure, the U.S. runs around for quite a while with a strange combat well not really strange but an annoying combination of 7.62 and 12.7s and the 7.62s are also kind of crap you know i'd say they're about on par with the 7.7s used by the british in terms of how effective they are but nonetheless those few rounds that the americans have in their 12.7s are very useful in being able to turn uh, an engagement around compared to your 7.7 millimeter Vickers or Browning or whatever it is for which British aircraft you're flying. And you just don't do damage. You're going for death by a thousand paper cuts. And I've, I've mentioned this numerous times in the past with some other countries' reserve aircraft um, and potentially even with non-reserve aircraft. They're a lot of these early aircraft suffer, particularly the biplanes suffer from lackluster uh, guns and ammo belts. Obviously this can be, you know, attributed to it's just the way they designed the aircraft back in the day, not necessarily Gaijin making that decision. But nonetheless, it is lackluster in many ways. As a result of this, in my experience, unless you get really lucky with pilot snipes, you're maybe getting two kills before you have to return to the airfield to get ammo. If you get lucky with some pilot snipes, you might be able to kick that number up to three or four, potentially. But generally, I would only ever plan for getting two kills in the Fury. 
uh, before you have to return to base to get some more ammo, because even if you have some ammo left over after the second kill, it's probably not enough to get a third. Obviously, though, it should be noted that getting pilot snipes is a little bit harder from the rear, because the Vickers machine guns used in the Fury here don't have particularly good penetration. And that's not helped by, even though most of the things you're going to shoot have very little armor, most of their armor is centered around the front uh, with a little bulletproof glass right in front of the pilot, and that's often about it. You're still needing to shoot through the structure, the external structure of the aircraft you're shooting at, and many of the aircraft you're going to go up against, because you have very little actual penetration power, even when firing AP rounds, you're just not going to get pilot snipes that easily outside of enemy biplanes where the pilots are often exposed from the rear. Anything that has like a full-on cockpit with just 360 degree armoring around it, well not really armoring, but you know what I mean, a fully enclosed cockpit, you're going to struggle with those when it comes to getting pilot snipes in a lot of cases because you're just not going to have the penetration power, particularly at distance, to get them. And a lot of those aircraft will often be faster than you. But, so as a result, you're going to often want to get close in when possible. But again, monoplanes are going to be faster than you generally, so good luck there. Moving on, however, from the lackluster firepower of the Fury, and again, many of the early British aircraft, the Fury has a really nice climb rate in game. In game, in realistic battles, which is the stats I always use for this, when spaded, you have a climb rate of 15.7 meters per second. This puts you above the German Heinkel HE-51, the American P-26, the Soviet I-15s, the Italian CR-32s. Park correctly for the CR-32s, you're like well above it. Because I think those are at like 9-something when spaded, if I'm recalling correctly. I might be misremembering. But I believe you're actually quite high above the CR-32s. Um, you're also above the French D-371 and D-373. You are on par, however, with the Japanese P-10 and the Swedish J-8A, which is actually just a Gloucester Gladiator export model. Yeah. You are also very nimble. That can be attributed to the fact that you're a biplane. A lot of the biplanes are very nimble in-game. I imagine they were also like that in real life, but I've never flown a biplane. I'm just going to take a guess there that they are fairly nimble, largely thanks to the fact that they don't quite have the speed of a lot of the monoplanes, so they don't pick up speed like there's no tomorrow, forcing them to have to make wide turns. They're also able to make turns at lower speeds just because of the fact that they have the extra lift of more wings. And you also, as a benefit of the Fury, although I believe this is the case with most of the biplanes in-game. Because you have an all-metal construction, which again, I believe this is the case with most, if not all, of the biplanes in-game. You are at least able to actually take some shots. Especially to your wings, without them just falling off from a handful of hits. You will get holes punched in them and you will lose your lift, your ability to generate lift as a result of that. but. At the very least, your wings are probably not going to just fall off because somebody put three rounds into you. Which, even though most air, most of the biplanes, like I said, I'm pretty sure have all metal constructions, some of them don't seem to quite hold on as well when they get shots into their wings. Some of them, they just fall out of the sky if they get just a couple shots into the wing. But that's not really an issue here with the Fury, in my experience. Uh, depending on how I cut up some of the footage I played in the background, you will see me at one point take a fairly decent amount of damage to wings and still be able to fly without too much of, an, too much of a hassle. 
But that's going to be it for this aircraft. There really isn't a whole lot to say about it. You know, a couple of complaints, a couple of... It's got some good things going for it. And this will be a common issue, particularly with the early aircraft. Especially those that saw limited combat in real life. And especially if that limited combat was largely against superior aircraft. I don't have a whole lot of uh, frame of reference to try and compare against when it comes to how the vehicle uh, handles in game compared to how it supposedly handles in real life. And that's an issue here with the Fury. Its only combat experience was a little bit during the Spanish Civil War, and then when it was getting blown out of the sky the by German aircraft in Yugoslavia. A little hard to really compare there. It just there isn't a whole lot of historical reference to pull through to when it comes to seeing if it lives up to its real life uh, expertise or its real life capabilities in combat. And like I said, this will be a common issue with a lot of these early aircraft because a lot of these early aircraft in particular aren't very good. Many of them aren't garbage, but they're also just not very good. So that's going to be it for this episode. A quick reminder that I do have a Discord server, which is my go-to place for posting about what's going on with the channel when it comes to uh, anything that will potentially interrupt my ability to create content, whether that be doing live streams or doing recorded videos, or, you know, basically like this series is also a recorded video with a uh, post commentary done. You can find a link to that down below in the description, alongside links to my Patreon and a Streamlabs donation link. You can support the channel using either of those links. Patreon comes with some extra goodies such as early access to videos, however Patreon does take a 5% cut if I recall correctly is what it is, it's something like that. They do take a cut of whatever it is that you give, but you get some extra goodies like I said. The other option is to go ahead and do a monthly donation if you really want to do monthly. Streamlabs added that option a few months back. To do a monthly donation via Streamlabs, you can also do one time of course. The channel takes home, I'm pretty sure, basically 100% of whatever you donate there because Streamlabs themselves do not take a cut. Uh, they get their money from people buying their Prime subscription thingamajigger, uh, which I don't personally have a use for because even though I do do live streams, it's I can't really justify the cost because um, I'm not a big live streamer. I do it once, maybe twice a week or so. And I don't get a ton of viewers either, so it's a little hard to justify the price of that uh, for me personally. But nonetheless, that's how they make their money for the most part. So if you go the Streamlabs donation route, the channel takes home. Like I said, I'm pretty sure it's 100% because I don't think anybody actually takes a cut whatsoever there. So that helps the channel out much more than going the Patreon route. However, you do not get any of the goodies that Patreon provides because I don't have a good way of automating, um, confirming uh, that monthly donations in particular have executed successfully so that I can easily um, add and remove access automatically to getting early access to videos. I just don't have a good way of doing that right now, so it, it just doesn't happen. If I ever figure out a way to do that, maybe I'll give the same benefits to Streamlabs as I do Patreon. But either way, so I will see you all in the next video where we will be heading back to Italy to cover their reserve aircraft because the first Italian aircraft we covered, I'm pretty sure it was the first one. I definitely know that we covered the CR-42. I just can't recall if that was the first Italian aircraft or who was the second because I believe I also covered, what was it, the C-50 or something like that? Um, when I covered those, that was back when Italy was not its own separate tree and they were just a part of the German tree. So, the CR-32 did not exist at the time, but now it does, so I need to go back and cover that aircraft. So that's going to be what we're going to cover next time. After that, I think we are probably going to be going back to Japan to cover the uh, P-27, uh, but we'll see. You know, I could change my schedule around after some time. But yeah, so that'll be it for this video. I will see you all next time. 
As always, like, favorite, comment, subscribe, share if you feel so inclined. And I will see you all next time. Until then, goodbye and farewell.